music can be defined as vocal or instrumental sounds combined in such a way as to produce beauty of form and harmony. Its purpose is to express and modulate emotions. And music is an intentionally organized art form whose medium is sound and silence with core elements of pitch, rhythm, dynamics, and the qualities of timber and texture. Around 200 years ago, a Harvard professor and poet, Henry Longfellow, first uttered the phrase, music is the universal language of mankind. The types of music people like seem to usually fall in line with whatever your parents didn't like. But that isn't always the case. My favorite band of all time, and much of it because I had so many amazing experiences with them, and that was a band that began before my time. They never liked to identify as any particular genre of music, and they touched on all of my favorites. The most well-known member began with his experience playing Scruggs-style banjo. And once he switched to the electric guitar, his lead lines were heavily influenced by jazz soloists. And he noted Miles Davis, Bill Evans, and Pat Martino as a few. The bass player was originally a classically trained trumpet player. And he didn't tend to play traditional blues-based bass forms, but more melodic, symphonic, and complex lines, often sounding like a second lead guitar. The other guitarist modeled his style of playing after jazz pianist Alfred McCoy Tyner and attempted to replicate the interplay between John Coltrane and Tyner in his support an occasional subversion of the harmonic structure of the singer's voice. The two drummers developed a unique, complex interplay, balancing one's steady shuffle beat with the other's interest in percussion styles outside the normal rock tradition. The original keyboardist, he was the blues guy, although throughout the 30 years they played, by the end, there had been a total of four keyboardists and each one of them bringing something new. And I'm speaking, of course, about the Grateful Dead. And the reason I bring this up is because we have a guest today who plays one of my favorite genres of music. I have Rick Delarada, who is now considered by many to be one of the finest singer, pianist, jazz artists performing today. So please stay tuned. I think you're going to like this. My name is Eric McCoy, and this is High Wall Clean. Now, before we get started, I want to mention a program that I'm affiliated with in Southern California. It's called New Creation Treatment Program. If anybody is struggling and looking for a good program, give them a call. Let them know that you heard about them from Eric McCoy on High Wall Clean. Uh, their website is newcreationtreatment.com, and their phone number is 877 
868-5730, and I'll, it'll also be posted. All right, so our guest today is Rick Delarada, and his achievements are amazing. And I'm going to, I want to actually read something that I directly got from his site because I honestly could not say this any better. Uh, his achievements as a world-class musician, as well as his musical message through jazz to create peace and sharpen the minds of all mankind to its highest potential were summed up when he was referred to as Mr. Jazz by former President George W. Bush and also congratulated by former President Barack Obama for, quote, everything he has accomplished to this point and challenging humanity to realize that the forces that unite us are far stronger than the forces that divide us. Now, in 2002, uh, Rick Delarada and Jazz for Peace performed at the United Nations headquarters in New York City. Uh, they led a band that consisted of Middle Eastern, both Arab and Israeli, uh, European, Asian, American jazz musicians in concert for an international audience. They have funded over 850 causes, from what I could see. Uh, he is dedicated to helping children through his education series and instrument donation program. And I think I can go on and on. And oh, he was also a piano player in the TV show, The Deuce, what I kind of saw also. <laughs> Rick, how are you doing? <laughs> good, good. That's cool that you saw that. That's a, that's a great story, actually. <laughs> so um, I want to actually, before we get started, I want to I ask you a question here. And I saw this on your site also. And it says that 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 you are one of uh, only a handful of jazz artists who can make a successful musical presentation to a large audience without having to abandon the true art of jazz. What does that mean? Okay, I'm so glad you asked that. At the time that that was written, um, that's that's a uh, you know that's kind of my website is uh, my bio is has kind of remained the same because my achievements have grown with Jazz for Peace and it's kind of grown you know my. I'm kind of my career has grown in tandem with my organization. Uh, but at the time that was written about me um, as a singer instrumentalist, what, what was happening with jazz and what the average public probably doesn't know is they were taking the name jazz. They were using that name and just putting it on things that happened to be popular. OK, calling it jazz. Now people are like, oh, well, I already like this. And now it's called, they're calling it jazz. So I guess I like jazz because I already like this. They're putting the name jazz on it. That means I like jazz. And I get it. I guess it was, you know, uh, co you know, major corporations are known for these kind of shenanigans all the way through time. I mean, you know, they're following their profit motives. They're, you know, they're doing what they need to do for their bottom line. We think they're looking out for us by whatever, some sort of a miscommunication that's also probably done on purpose. We don't know through the media. Um, that goes down to a guy named Edgar Bernays, uh, who was, who was, um, he was the, he was the nephew of that fame, Sigmund Freud. And he went to corporations. This is a wild story too, but he went to corporations and said, Hey, I can take, I, you know, I can take my uncle's, I can show you how to take my uncle's teachings and use it to manipulate the masses into in, in your favor. Anyway, um, what you will see, and you will see this if you go look just back in history, uh, you know, major like whatever they got together and they took the name jazz and they put it on things. Okay. And I, at the time, my goal was to be a marketable jazz artist. So I did not want to leave the language of jazz, the art form of jazz, whatever. I wanted to be marketable within that frame. That was my goal, you know, because I'm thinking I got to do two things. I got to be true to my art form and I somehow have to make ends meet. So right. I'm like, OK, I'll be a marketable jazz musician, you know, and I figured I could do it because I, you know, I, I sing, I play, I compose, uh, I play a wide variety of styles, et cetera, et cetera. But you will see this, um, you know, I mean, Nora Jones is, a, is an example. She's a great, uh, wonderful singer. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the music. But she's a wonderful uh, singer and, 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 you know, musician and does great song, you know, wonderful presentation, great music. But you're not likely to hear much of the art form of jazz in her, you know, in, in that show. Okay. I didn't hear any, I mean, I didn't hear any jazz. So, but 
the Grammys came up and s not one, okay, six Grammy Awards, I believe she won one year. The year that I kind of put this on my bio, do you know what I'm saying? And so, you know, it was, and then, then you'd see like Blue Note Records would sign, they, they would have this big signing. The signing was Van Morrison, you know what I mean? Right. Great artists, wonderful. Jazz, no, yeah. you know what I mean? Art, uh, wonderful artists. I mean, I've sang his songs in piano bars and I've had a wonderful time. I love, love singing Jane, uh, you know, his song. Great jazz artists, no, you know what I mean? And then you'd see jazz festivals and you'd see the headliner. Sometimes it would be Bruce Springsteen, New Orleans <laughs> Jazz Fest, you know? Great tunes, wonderful, nothing against Bruce at all. Jazz, no, you know yeah. what I mean? No, that's not jazz. And you'd see, you'd see, you'd see artists like Aretha Franklin, who's, you know, was fantastic. I, I don't think she's with us now. I'm, I'm not sure if she's with us right now. I'm, but anyway, in, when she was performing, you know, they'd have Gladys Knight and the Pips. I mean, I love them. They're not, you know, quote unquote jazz. It's not a jazz, you know what I mean? So that's why I put that on my, um, that's why I put that there. How do you define jazz? Well, jazz is a, you know what it is? It's kind of an ocean of improvisational contributions. You follow me? Um, you know, what we try to do as a musician, first of all, we want to pay reverence to the greats that came before us. And that's in the Jazz for Peace poem that I'm going to perform to you at some point at your leisure. But, um, uh, you know, we, we listen to all these greats, whether it's Charlie Parker or John Coltrane or Louis Armstrong or this one or that one, uh, you know, we find, and we hopefully draw, you know, inspiration from them. And hopefully what we hope to do is through all of this study and learning and all that, we hope to, we hope to drop our own little drop into the ocean. You see what I mean? So it's, it's, we, we hope that we can make our own little drop. You know, our, our, our own little, we have our own little flavor, our own little style, something that makes you think, oh, that's, that's Louis Armstrong. That's, you know, maybe that's Rick Dolorada. I mean, that would be, that would, I would hope be a goal of a jazz musician to want to make his own little contribution. Let me show you, let me get, let me get your thoughts here. So I was going through some of my old records here. Fred Waring and his Pennsylvanians. Um, it looks like maybe it was kind of a big band music. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. You got Jess, Jess, Stacy. Okay. I mean, I again, I haven't heard of, I haven't heard of him. These but are if I these are old. Um, yeah. These records are. I think this one was the early fifties. Okay. Uh, Lionel Hampton. Yeah. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. Lionel. So Lionel Hampton. Lionel Hampton was the kind of guy that if you were a jazz musician and you had to put bread on the table you would want to try to get in his band if you weren't well known enough and just trying to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you'd want to get in his band because there are other jazz musicians in that band. So, you know, your, your, and Hamp's music did feature jazz. When you heard the guy solo, you know, the soloist, that's jazz, what they would play. I mean, those were jazz musicians and they were playing jazz. How about uh, Eddie Duchin? Eddie Duchin, I mean, I think he might have been the father of a guy named Peter Duchin, who was kind of a society musician. Uh, I, I'd have to hear that, but it might kind of be society, high society music. See, here's the thing. What, what you have is you'll have music and then you'll hear jazz within it. Al Martino? Well, that was a great song. I loved that song when I was a kid. Da, 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 love is blue. Do, da, 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 da. It's a beautiful song. Beautiful love song. Love is blue. How about uh, yeah, Al, Al Hurt? Yeah, Al Hurt was kind of an old New Orleans jazz man, New Orleans jazz oh. guy. He was a real traditional New Orleans jazz kind of a, you know, a showman, actually. A little bit of a showman. I mean, he had this... I believe he had could play these really high notes and just had a you know he had a thing he had a he had quite a charisma yeah and then I got a uh, Lex Golden okay not that familiar with him but like I said if I, I if I heard the music I could definitely describe it if I heard yeah. it okay and then of course I got Nat King Cole I got a lot well Nat King Cole is an is an interesting story because Nat King Cole to be honest with you was a great jazz pianist 
And what they did when they marketed him is they said, we're going to take away your piano and we're just going to put you out front as a singer. And so they let him play teeny little bits. If you saw a Nat King Cole show, he might start out something with little, just a little few seconds here and a few seconds there. And that's the last you heard of, of his great jazz piano that they just didn't feel was, you know, it comes down to what can we make the most money with? And they always, right. you know. They always, you know what I'm saying? It's it's tough when you're competing with like just whatever's the most profitable. You know, I mean, you know, crack and meth are more profitable than jazz. So how are we going to compete? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then uh, Roy Eld Eldridge. Oh my God, that's a legend. Roy mm -hmm. Eldridge is a legend, and um, I just wrote good wishes to a friend of mine who used to play in his band. Mm -hmm. because he had been hospitalized and I just found out about it yesterday on like Facebook and I, I wrote, you know, hey, best wishes, get better soon. Just, mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things that you write. Mm -hmm. um, but um, he had this, the, the man I'm talking about had, had, I went to school with him. He had played in Al Roy, with Roy Eldridge and Roy Eldridge made such a mark on him that, I mean, he uh, to this day sounds like a protege of Roy Eldridge, to be honest with you. He just, yeah. he plays that style like, like it's nobody, like he, he plays that style, style like he lived, like he lived it. Okay. So I want to let everybody know, obviously we are recording this on 9-11. Um, and now you had brought up that um, on 9-11 of 2001, when the towers were hit, what did you write? Well, here's what happened. Um, uh, the day before that, I was, I had a, someone was taking pictures of me and not everybody knows this, but photographers, if they're smart there and they're in New York city, they go around and find somebody that might be famous in the future or that they think might be or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they go up to that person and they say, Hey, I, you probably need pictures, right? And you know, the guy's like, well, yeah, well, I think I do. I'll tell you what, I'll take some pictures of you and I'll give you copies for free. And from and I'll keep the you know I'll keep the the originals for my catalog right, and that's how um, Linda McCartney became Linda McCartney hmm. because she walked around as a before she never knew about who Paul McCartney was you know she was walking around uh, downtown here in the village and bumping into Bob Dylan and uh, you know. Um, uh, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Jimi Hendrix and all those people, right? Janis Joplin, they were all playing in these little, you know, these little divey folk bars, you know? And he, she would say, hey, can I take some pictures of you? And I'll give you the negative, you know? And she, and so when those guys blew up, she was the only one who had pictures of them, you know? In other words, you either, you either better call them, you know, you know, how are you gonna call and get the, if you needed pictures of them before they were famous, you had to call Linda McCartney. And so she became a well-known photographer by doing that. And so that's how she got to shoot the Beatles. Then she met Paul. So anyway, that was happening to me. A woman was doing that. She was taking pictures of me. Um, if you ever look at the Jazz for Peace CD, if you ever look at that CD, that's one of the pictures. It's a picture of me in front of a dumpster, kind of, with a little chain. And she took that picture. And that was the day before? That was the... The day before nine said September 10th, okay. I believe, I believe it was September 10th. And she had taken these pictures. And like I said, that one of them, you can see on the cover of the Jazz for PCD, cause she, you know, she gave it to me and um, she called me up the next day because I was in, you know, we were, you know, we talked, we'd hung out and all that. And we were, you know, she just needed to make a phone call that morning because it was, it was so strange, you know, life was so strange that mm -hmm. she was having a strange morning. Let's put it that mm -hmm. way. And I was sleeping. And I get a call in my East Village apartment and I'm like, it's her. And she says, hey, I, you know, I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm having the weirdest morning. You know, I said, what happened? Well, my boss is very close with his son. They talk every day. His, you know, she's down on Wall Street because she's working for like, a, you know, in the financial district. Mm -hmm. That's her day job. So she can be an artsy photographer, you know, the rest of the time. And um her boss had, uh, his son had called from the other tower and said like a plane flew in or there was an explosion, something happened in the other tower, what should I do? And they're talking back and forth and finally they decided, you know what, just get the hell out of there. We don't, who the hell knows what's going on? Get out of there. Go get in this, get in the elevator, leave, you know, leave the, just get out of there. Get out, might as well get, play it safe, get out of that area. 
And that was the last he ever saw his son. So she called me after that call came into his, to her boss. And she just said, you know, I, I, and I'm like, you know what? I have this, I have no, you know what? Let me go up and take a, take a look. Let me go up there. So, cause I, I lived on the fifth floor walk up and the, the roof was above me. I used to go up on the roof all the time. Cause I was already there on the fifth floor. Mm. I just went up on the roof and boom. Next thing I knew the second building got hit. And, um, mm. I was just, you know, in a surreal, I was watching, I was in a movie, you know, I was like, I had walked into the screen of a movie, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And, uh, basically words came out of me. Like I didn't, you know, I didn't actually, you know what I mean? I didn't ponder the words just kind of came because of what could else, I mean, what other, what can you do in a situation like that? You know? There's nothing you could, there's nothing I could think of to do except write down the words that were coming out of my, just, you know, coming out of my body, like out of my sweat. You know, they were just, you know, like I said, it was kind of like just giving birth. You're going to go ahead and play us something now. Right. So this is the jazz piece poem. I'm going to, I'm going to improvise underneath it, just make some stuff up. Then I'm going to go into a little bit of an improvisation uh, which I do ev- different for every podcast. And this is called Free JA. And this gets into children because I'm very much concerned about um, the bombing of innocent civilians and children during wartime. And especially that if it, w- if it goes unreported, it's almost like a carte blanche for, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, both sides to do that, to do that be stuff. And, mm-hmm. and I really don't want to see those, those kind of things happen to, ch- to children, to anybody, but you know, we're, t- I mean, good God, I mean, a children, what, what the hell does he need to be bombed for? You know, what, what does a kid need to do? So then I'm going to go with that into the end of a, of an Italian song called Estate. Okay. And this is, is just to sing a little bit in Italian. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know. It reminds me a little bit of my grandfather who came over on a boat with an accordion and a wine press. Okay. I hear jazz for peace. Coming through the trees. And in my heart it fills me like a celebration. I see the light and I want to follow. Inspired by the past contributions of those that came before. And laid the groundwork for us to build on this universal language that is a gift for all mankind. that leads to reaching potential that we have in our soul so we can raise our total conscience and see the gift of giving is our greatest privilege I hear jazz for peace
Amazing. <laughs> how long, so how long have you been playing? I started when I was about six, and that's because um, a piano came into the house on um, Christmas Eve, and it was a very big fat guy on the back end of it, moving it, who I thought had to have been Santa Claus. And I figured, you know, if he brought this thing in here and I caught him doing it, I better find out what the heck it is. Mm. You know, our show obviously is high wall clean. Um, right. And, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we're very much about inspiration, hope, you know, for people obviously with substance abuse and or mental health issues. Uh, we work to fight the stigma of substance abuse. And so I'm going to throw the question at you. Have you ever had a substance abuse problem? I'll tell you something. If you're involved in music, the music industry, <laughs> um, you know, uh, during during my time, now I don't know about the time now going forward, you know, things are changing and, and the whole world is changing very fast. But I mean, you, you're, we're, we're probably somewhat similar in age, close enough to know. I mean, I saw your, I saw your laugh. So your expression kind of said it all. I mean, if you are, if you were, if you were a musician during the time I was a musician, uh, you know, you were around, you name it, you were around it, uh, you had access to it. It was, um, you know, you hear the stories of some of these guys, you know, how they, you know, I mean, people, you know, when people do it, sometimes you're the man they want to do it with, or they, you know, turn all that stuff, you know. Uh, so I will absolutely say that, you know, and, and, and one thing that's interesting about it is, um, the, what what we don't realize because i did check out your you know to to because i wanted to talk about this issue with you and i so i wanted to watch one of your shows see how you do it and i also watched a couple of other videos that i watched too it just intermittently you know as well on the subject because we have these two areas one is kensington as you probably know in philadelphia and this other one is in in um la where people put up these videos i don't know if you know about the videos but people take you know there's like videos that they put up of they interview these people anyway um what we don't know when you're growing up and you're a musician because you think you're partying you know you think you're you think it's a party you think it's uh it's something that you do after a show you know it's all that stuff is into play but what you don't realize is that your participation is a step that leads to another that can lead to this you know you've gotten yourself closer to this step now it's up to you if you can get if you can go back here that's cool but right now you're here you're closer to this step do you mm -hmm. know what i mean yeah and so um uh the yesterday i think it was yesterday just in thinking about your show i was watching this woman in philadelphia which she could have been in la i mean they have these like these you know these areas where people you know that people go they're hardcore drug areas uh when they're where they're addicts and she had lost everything. You could tell she was incredibly beautiful and she still was, but nowhere near, you know, you can, you know, you can do the deduction of what it's done to her and how much she's lost and all that. And, um, you know, they don't realize that um, your this step leads to this step. And then that step leads to this step. If you go to that step, that's going to lead to this step. You don't realize that, you know, you don't realize that you are putting yourself in jeopardy for the net for the for the next step down the path yeah every choice we make it, it leads to somewhere it leads to somewhere and not only that but addiction is not just substances and drugs True. it can be so many things you know you see these people you see these people with lots of money instead of doing instead of instead of going in a direction of of you know with something doing something productive with that money they're trying to do something mega profitable because they uh, you know, they only know they're addicted from going from 1 billion to 2 billion. They're addicted yeah. to that. Yeah. So behavioral, you know, behavioral addictions. And we, we kind of define it as the same thing. People do it for the same reasons. Uh, but, you know, you throw your life way out of balance. You focus. I mean, you can get addicted to music, you know, and that just become your entire life. And are there other things you're missing out on, which could be important, you know, maybe a family or, um, of course, you then you've got workaholics, you got the gambling addicts, sex addicts, you know, all of those types of things. But yeah, the music industry, and I've had numerous, um, you know, people on our show um, that were from mm -hmm. the music industry. Um, right. And that, you know, that, and obviously, you know, the entertainment industry obviously have the two most well-known 
areas and fields to get in if you want to do a lot of drugs. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, what's funny, there was an interview of that guy, uh, Ricky Gervais, right? You know, he is, he's a comedian. He, he was, if you want to watch something funny, because this guy, I mean, he's done a lot of stuff, but the one thing he did that was just drop dead hilarious, he was the host on, I believe it's either the, the Grammys, not, not the Grammys, but the Academy Awards, I think, the Academy Awards. He did it like five years in a row or something. He okay. was a host on one of those big shows. Yeah. You know, whether it's the, it wasn't, I think it was the Academy Awards, but it was one, it was an award show for the, for the, for the film industry, major award show, and he was the host. And he just, you know, I mean, he's just absolutely hilarious. But there was an interview of him where he said he wanted to be a musician and has told his mother that and his mother basically said uh, you know kind of something like i can't quote but so you know so you want to be a drug addict it's kind of right. like that I mean, she just you know what i mean yeah. she just yeah. was like yeah. that means you're going to be you want to be a musician means drug addict you know it was just like you know that's what it means rick gervais did have a band and here's a photo of him and then here is him singing And that's the sad part, though, is that, you know, I mean, you look at even some of the bigs, I mean, died mm -hmm. of even Elvis Presley. Right. Like, sort of pushed right. into that Jimi mm -hmm. Hendrix, you know, Janis right. Joplin. Um, my my favorite band of all time. Um, and, and, and it honestly, you know, they're not a jazz band, but they sort of actually in a lot of ways, some of them evolved from jazz. But the Grateful Dead mm -hmm. was my, was one of my favorite bands of all time. Um, with Jerry Garcia getting into coke and heroin, and of course him dying at fifty three and heavy deep 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 into it. Jerry Garcia was, you know, I've read some stuff, I've read some autobiographical little stuff, and he was flat out all the way, you know, just junkified. Of course, the prob here's another problem: you you're partying along as a musician because it's like you know, uh, it, it's something that you you know you you know what I mean? It's like it's kind of working for a minute, you know, it's working. Hey, I, I did the gig. I didn't, you know, I did I did my thing. The gig went well. It was successful. Let's celebrate. It's a celebration. You're thinking it's a celebration, right? You think you're celebrating, but you don't realize. And then for some of these guys, they get money. You know, I, at one time I had, uh, there was a time when I had m enough money to like say, well, if I want to, I'm, and I realized quickly, I can't do any more that doesn't mean does, the money is irrelevant. The, what I can't, the fact that I could, that the fact that I have the money does not mean is not going to help me at all because I cannot bring any more of that in my life. Right. I cannot, do you know what I mean? Right. I can't, my life can't take any more of it. Right. You know, I can't because because the thing is, in order to rationalize it, if I mean, and let the, you're you're an addict if you can't, if you know what I mean. In other words, in order to rationalize it and not be an addict, you have to function well. You have to make all your things. You have to get, you know, you have to do all that. And you're fighting that you're you're fighting that because you're, you know, those nights, you know, they're, they're, they last all night. And sometimes they're a lot of fun. And sometimes there's a beautiful girl involved or whatever. You know, sometimes it's like, hey, that was great. But they bleed. It bleeds into this. It bleeds into that, you know, and you have to you have to fight it. You have to struggle it. And then you have to struggle with not, not doing it because it's like, you know, you get you, you start to get a Jones and you have to fight it. And then you have to fight. You have you know what you're doing? You're you're opening the door up to a war that you have to rage with this other thing. You know, you have to be fighting it all the time. And that brings me back to the story that I wanted to tell you, because this woman, she had been clean because they always ask these people, have you had some clean time? Well, she was clean for two years. And when they were like, so, you know what? And well, she was like, well, I was you know, she was she was doing these things where like she would every day go and give at a, at a food bank. She volunteered at a food bank. Then she go this, this to good and she do that good and do that good. Deed. And what happens was that gets them out of it. But then they stop their routine and they stop. And she said in the show, because some of these shows I can't watch because they're too depressing. But she said in the show, as soon as I stopped giving back, as soon as I stopped helping, as soon that was enriching her spirit, yeah. the helping others. Yeah. And as soon as she stopped helping others, she became vulnerable again. 
And then the addiction, the addiction is all about feeding yourself. You're feeding a monster. You know, it's all about you. You always say you relapse, you know, mentally before you do physically, like pick up. So I probably, um, I wasn't doing as much service work. Right. I started pulling back on giving out food and clothes to the other people down here. Yeah. Um, I started going about more about me. That's understandable. That's you know understandable. I mean? As soon as I started doing that, as soon as I started thinking about only me, I don't think about others, I end up picking up. When I focus on myself and only myself. Yep. So you're crossing the Rubicon back to yep. addiction, which is, you know, and not only that, when you're addicted, you can't help others because you are, you know what I mean? You have yep. to get yourself straight and all that stuff. Absolutely. You got to, I mean, you've got to be good yourself first. I like what you said, though, and I want to touch on that real quick, that I honestly think that all happiness, like when I look at myself, you know, the happiness that I get in life, the enjoyment that I find in life um, comes from putting my hand out and helping people. You know, I think honestly, it's the, you know, it's the people that are stay away from me. The ones that are selfish, the ones that just, you know, want to be, they're miserable people. Right. I think it, as human beings, we're social beings, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, I'm in recovery myself. Um, I had the, sto the story of, I had 11 years and I relapsed. Um, and there was, you know, and a big part to that was I lost my passion in life. You know, I'd kind of gone through this situation with um, the ex-business partner I had. I lost my passion and uh, and then made bad choices. Right. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think I think that and that's what I, I really liked about reading up on your stuff was, I mean, you, you're really about putting your hand out. You're really about helping people. You're really about let's, you know, look at our future, our children. Uh, right you know, and seeing what we can do to make it a better world. Right. Well, you know, I learned that that is where personal wealth comes from. And that wealth, um, you know, we get all these subliminal messages from these companies that, you know, want to want to make monetary wealth. And, you know, we got to be real careful because, uh, you know, we next thing you know, we've somehow drank some Kool-Aid and who knows which commercial we saw that caused us to drink it, where we think that that it really is wealth. That's all the wealth. No, no, no. That's just like one piece of the puzzle. You know, um, you don't you know what I mean? It's like there's all these there's all these stories of people that went and did that and found out they didn't have wealth inner wealth you know what i mean now you've got to go play catch up and get that you know but the inner uh helping people and and that woman just she hit the nail on the head what she has to do you know if you look in um if you look at other species i mean look at these ants and these bees i mean they they're helping each other they're helping like they're all their energy is going towards helping and i think you need to do that to build personal wealth to begin with, you know, yeah. but it also becomes a protective shield from, uh, from, you know, f you know, you know, full on addiction and things like that. Yeah. You know, I think the more, if you want to, if you want to, if you want to help yourself, help others. Yeah. I mean, you got to obviously have something to give, but you know, so you got to help right. first. But, you know. Well, but you know, what's, here's, what's weird. And, and it was like, um, you know, I think it was Tony Robbins who said this, and I don't know if he got it from someone else, but he said, uh, you can always find somebody out there doing worse at yeah. something than you, yeah. always. Yeah. And you can help that person. Yeah. So, you know, you're always in a position to help somebody. Um, I was one time, you know, one of the, one of the situations of help that, I, that I, like to, I like to think about and just smile, put a smile on my face. I had gone to Utah uh, to be a ski bum because I wanted to be a ski. The problem with me, because the things I wanted to be, they paid like nothing. You know, I want to be a jazz artist in New York City. I want to be a ski bum. I saw it as a kid. I thought it was a job, you know, look yeah. fun. So I wanted to be a ski bum. I never was a ski bum. Well, I had a chance to be a ski bum and I went out to Utah to do that. I was, I was an expert skier anyway from ski in the East. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had messed around by playing at ski resorts, playing music at ski resorts, and they give me the tickets and all that stuff. And so I kept it going. But now I was just going to go out and do it for a season. And that ended up being a lot of seasons. I, that's a whole nother, mm -hmm. that's a whole nother addiction, but it's a, it's a positive <laughs> one. Anyway, I'm out there now. 
and I'm staying in some little ski bum house with a bunch of ski bums, you know, and I have a bicycle and I'm riding the bike to the ski bus and I'm going to take the ski bus to the mountain, you know, and it's a powder day. It's the day you're living for. All the things that you're doing are lead up to this moment because you got to be on first tram, the first tram up to the top. You got to be on that to hit the, you know, and you got to know where to go. And just, it's a whole, it's a ritual. It's a, I don't know what you'd call it, a subculture. Mm -hmm. So I'm on the bike now. I've done everything, done all my homework. I'm ready. I go to my bike. Is a flat. Mm. It was a flat. I can't ride it to the ski bus. I'm going to miss the bus. I'm going to not be on the, the first trip. I'm going to admit that powder's going to get skied. You know, this is just one of them things. And I'm resigned to, you know what? I did. I'm, I'm kind of like stoic philosophy. You know, I did everything I could do and you did your best. You know, I'm not going to, you can't beat yourself up. This just happened. What are you going to do? Somehow the air came out of that tire. Now I'm going to walk it to the, to the ski bus because at, at where I walk it to, there is a, you know, some place where I can get the tire fixed or, or get air, air in the tire, whatever. So as I'm walking, I walk this is right out of where I'm staying, right out of where I'm staying, walk in the car, a car drives by, pulls over to the side. The man gets out of the car. He goes, hey, I said, yeah, what's up? Yeah, hey, hey what's up? You, yeah, you need air in that tire, right? I said, uh, yeah, I need air in that. I got it, I got it, I got it. He opens up his back thing, pulls out a freaking pump that's in his trunk, comes over with the pump, pumps the air into my tire. Man, I am, it tells me how happy he is. Yeah. I've been riding around with this stupid freaking thing in my trunk for months, and you just gave me the freaking chance to use this thing. I am so sorry. He's jumping for joy, puts the air in my tire. Gets back in the car, happy as a pig and shit. And I just ride and catch the bus. I ride there, just barely make that bus and hit that powder. I mean, I'm like, this guy's a freaking hero. But he was, you know ha he was happier than you. He was happier <laughs> than me. And the thing is, it's like, don't tell me that you can't help somebody. I don't care what stage of life. And you know what? The sooner you do it, the more, the better you're going to feel. And the more the, that is. That is ammunition against your adversities. And for a lot of people, their biggest adversity is addiction of some sort or other. And for a lot of them, it's the, you know, the, the addiction that we're talking about with drugs, alcohol, whatever it is, they're, they're major, unbelievable. Issues. And we have a setup in place where they're making people devoid of this opportunity because mm -hmm that's it's profitable for them it's prop for you to be addicted running around the street you know the your you the the pharmaceutical company is your pimp right right because yeah. you're running around getting money boosting things whatever you can do to get that money prostituting if you're a woman and you're giving it for blues they call it blues yeah. now the whatever season. you're taking yeah, yeah whatever you're taking and you know and and it's you know in the pharmaceutical companies and and they just got their they just got their cue from the drug dealers they're like well why why don't we just make all that money mm -hmm. we can bribe the senators and whatever we can talk them into saying that oxycotton is a is not addictive. Oh, yeah. I mean, insane. It is. You know, I was thinking on the the twelve step program, kind of where you know the the paradox of the twelve step program is mm. it's a selfish program, but the only way you get better is by helping other people. You know, and that's right. That's the paradox behind that. Um, I you know I was thinking I was thinking about this with the, with the jazz music, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm a big you know, and again, try to fight the stigma of substance abuse and all the crap that, you know, has been handed down and stuff. And I always think about the the true architect of the war on drugs, which was not Nixon. It was it was Harry Anslinger, right, before him. Okay, and tell me about that guy. So Harry Anslinger was the, he was the guy that pushed for the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act, right? Oh, wow. And so... So he was the head of what was called the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, the FBN, which is now the DEA, you know, the same organization. Okay. Um, but when that got passed, he guess who he targeted? Jazz musicians. And he went on roundups. Yeah. Of uh and it was probably he was a very racist man too, right? What what era was this? When was that? It 1930s? Was the night night thirties, forties, and fifties. Okay. So this guy played a big role. I know I know all about what he did. Yeah. Because they in New York City they had something called a cabaret card. Mm. And what they this was this was char this was to really go after jazz musicians. Yeah. And what they did was you got to have a card to play. 
So you got to first you got to have your card, right? And now because you have to have a card, guess what? They take away your card and they basically cancel culture you. You see mm. what I mean? Yeah. They whatever hashtag whatever it is, uh, me to you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they cancel culture you like they do, you know, in this in nowadays with other people. But, you know, they would if you lost your cabaret, if they took your cabaret card for any reason, they could frame you, do any, whatever, for whatever reason, you were finished. Yeah. And some of the greatest musicians, OK, didn't perform in New York at all because they didn't have a cabaret card and they didn't have the money to pay a lawyer to bribe, to feed the fish and bribe everybody to reinstate the cabaret card yeah. you know what i mean yeah. it took you know it took it took you know so and so to talk into such and such mm -hmm. and you know paying some money whatever you know stuff like that yeah. but yeah they targeted jazz musicians interesting they, they did and they they rounded him up i mean it was brutal he was wow. he was a very racist guy he was you know uh definitely targeting black people you know was, mm -hmm. the, was the big uh roundup that he was trying to do uh, right. and yeah, he actually held that office from, he held it longer than any, it was in the 30s all the way up through um, Kennedy. Uh, wow, all those years. Yeah, he headed that department <laughs> and hated, hated jazz musicians. <laughs> hated jazz musicians, isn't that something? It's incredible. It's really yeah. incredible. It's yeah. really incredible. It was, I, yeah, so... <laughs> That's an amazing story. I'm going to have to read up on that guy, Harry Ansling. Harry Ansling. Because I know what he did, but I never knew who the person was behind it. Yeah, all the his, little... his most his most famous the quote that he used in um, in the for the governmental um, uh, statement in Congress when they passed the act was marijuana is a dangerous use a dangerous drug that creates in its users insanity, criminality, and death. Oh my God! And this was. And then they also had that that propaganda little video, didn't reefer, they? So that was yeah. So nineteen reefer madness, right? Nineteen thirty six was reefer madness. Now oh, there's okay. there's a lot of debate on okay, did he have anything to do with it, or was it just like a coincidence kind of thing? Uh -huh. But yeah, it was nineteen thirty six was reefer madness, and then nineteen thirty seven was when that that uh, law was passed. We wow. <laughs> well, it's obvious that reefer madness was made to pass the law right i i would i would say they definitely either i think they definitely used the propaganda for it though yeah i mean you know what a per, what a what a coincidence you very, know very coincidence. what a coincidence this this <laughs> wacky propaganda movie comes out and then the laws pass yeah yeah Crazy. wow that's an incredible story yeah and that's the thing so the thing is um so jazz for peace you know yes. to bring it full circle yes. um i started finding out that i could use my music and i could use you know the art form of jazz which you know i could use music and the art form of jazz both they're universal languages they mm -hmm. cut through all barriers of race creed color uh you know uh religion everything cut through all those barriers and i could use it to help outstanding causes of which no one was helping, um, you know, uh, or, or of which there was, you know, a, a kind of a, a bias in that area too, you know what I mean? Of, you know, uh, outstanding causes that are, you know, it's really a, I mean, you could solve so many of the world's problems by helping the outstanding causes that are truly dedicated and passionate to do so. And that brings us back to the wealth that we're talking about. Yeah. A person, is rich inside who's really committed to solving those problems yeah not someone who's just using it to create a tax shelter i mean we always say music is the universal language right and music and, and the art form of jazz spoken everywhere and, and it is i i mean that was another thing you know jerry garcia go back to him was uh you know he mm -hmm. that was something he always believed too it's like if we could bring music we could bring peace to the world was kind of his fight too you know right they, um and I, it was 1972, I think, was they did their their year one of their European tours, one of the first bands to go to uh, Egypt, you know, mm -hmm. played in Egypt, and so yeah, that was a big you know thing with his. I agree with it, you know, music again, it's music is universal. I mean, what you know, it, it, it it's not even words spoken per se, just the instrumental aspects. 
Well, you know what? What that's why in the in the in the words in the lyrics, you know, I say um, inspired by the past contributions of those who came before. So mm -hmm. I'm talking about people like Jerry Garcia. I'm mm -hmm. talking about people like Dizzy Gillespie, who I was an opening act and emceeing for at one time. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, Louis Armstrong, these people who were part of jazz ambassadors that were sent around by the United States to spread goodwill through the, through the American art form of jazz. I'm talking about Gandhi. I'm talking about John Lennon. Yeah. I'm talking about all these people that came before and laid the foundation for us to build on. And my, my way of building on it is saying, let's redefine peace as saying, as, as something that uh, is saying that we can achieve, uh, you know, a better world by helping outstanding causes, because not only do we help, um, not only do we help those people, but we help all of their outreach. We address a problem today and we stop a problem that's on the way tomorrow. Yeah. So what uh, do you have any future? So you have some future events set up that you're working on or? Right now, yes, we we are receiving. Uh, well, I've done numerous stuff, things to help um, recovery related mm. types Good. of things. We need that right now yes this epidemic this overdose epidemic is i mean we just had um two we had one one ex-client that i work with he he died july 4th of this year okay uh, and we had another one that died about two weeks ago um wow uh fentanyl overdose okay and, uh and and right where are you located i'm in la county okay well you're there right where the that amazing where, where you hear the i think it's soft underbelly something like that i don't know if you ever heard of this video soft white underbelly this is a photographer who started fill he wanted to take pictures of homeless people and then he found it out that people wanted to hear their stories mm, yeah. and he started the stories just would come out on this thing and you would hear and they're all from that one area what's it called uh that area where they all from you you might you Skid Row. There you go. Skid that's Row. what that's what it's all from. Skid Row. It's yeah. all from Skid Row. I, I actually I'd had Tommy Chong on my show one time, right? Oh and, wow. And him and I were talking about um, you know, the homeless people. And we were talking about that and, and mm -hmm. you know, again, it goes back to that whole stigma, right? That, you know, we look at them, oh, you're dirty, they're dirty, waste of space, you know, that kind of but we don't know their story. Right. You know, nobody knows these people's story. And right and if if you know, some of us probably had any idea or went through anything that some of these people went through. We might be in bad shape, too. Well, that's mm -hmm. what this guy did. You can check it out. It's called Soft White yeah. Underbelly. And these people are telling their stories and getting a million hits per video. A yeah. million hits. I mean, some of them have like two million hits, people, because the stories are fascinating to people. And people are feel like they're being educated by hearing these people's stories because they didn't know. They just never knew their story, yeah. what they went through and, and all those kinds of things. And, you know, the whole thing that put you, you become vulnerable to addiction when shit happens in your childhood. Yeah. You know all this stuff. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? You become very vulnerable. You yeah, know, sexual abuse, physical right. abuse, and I had to learn that I had I was very vulnerable for things, and I had to I had to you know I I, I mean I've had to do a lot of I've had to do a lot of work uh, to you know to stay out of where these people end up but you know what you know what i have that they don't have i have a piano and they don't and i'm watching these i'm watching these videos eric and i'm like if that kid only had a piano is what i'm thinking and that principle behind the piano is a passion you right. know a drive for something you know right. um, something that maybe you see a light at the end of the tunnel you know and that's right. the piano to you Right. Right. Because I can sit there because, you, you know, listen, you know what's going on in these people's minds all day long. They're they're inches away from at, at any moment. It's like they're in a minefield. Right. And they could be having a wonderful day and then boom, they, they think about using yeah. and then boom, all they have to do. It could happen in, in a second. In one second off they go. You know, they're off off the rails. You know what I mean? But if you have a piano and you can maybe work out your work you're 
So you have something with a piano, you have a, like something in the distance that you can work towards. Mm -hmm. Now I was playing some of it for you. You were hearing some improvisational concepts that you can't hear anywhere else. You could listen to it thought, li and try it. Listen to 20 piano players. You might hear some incredible piano playing, but you're not gonna hear that right. that I just did. Right. You won't hear that. Right. And I'm like, you know what? I would rather get closer and closer to what I'm seeing out there. And, and, and then that's a little drop in this incredible ocean that I'm contributing to that blows away. Yeah. You know what I mean? A, a Jones, yeah. as powerful as the Jones is, yeah. you can blow it away with something like that. And I'm like, those guys don't have that ammunition. I feel so bad for them because they don't, you know what I mean? I know what they're going through. I'm telling you. And it's like unbelievable. But what I wanted to tell you was, we have done some interesting stuff. I mean, I, there's three that come with mine. One was in Atlanta for a recovery type of organization. Mm -hmm. Another one was here in New York for like a halfway house sort of thing. And I think I even sent you the testimonial. You would have to check mm -hmm. your email. You know, New York has um, the, I think it's the only current uh, safe injection sites in the United States. Really? And there's two of them. I, this, is, this is something that, so in California, our, our dumbass Governor Newsom, <laughs> right. Wow. I've heard stories I'm, about that. I'm, I'm really uh, this guy I have a hard time with, but he um, just recently vetoed a, mm -hmm. a uh, safe injection site, which really pisses me off um, because and his, his argument was that, well, you know, it, it, we we're, we don't want unintended consequences. Right. Well, let me tell you about the consequences. We had 10,000 uh, pe uh, people in California that died of an overdose last year. That's right. the consequences, right? right? Right. And so, you know, safe injection sites, in, and New York has two of them. Yeah, so they're basically, and I want to, I, I, like, I sort of got, I'm, I was talking, I had, you know, a radio show too, um, and I was mentioning on the radio show i was doing it i was doing this topic on safe injection sites uh -huh. and um and i said you know that i i want to literally open one up here in california what's uh -huh. the, i mean what am i what are they going to charge me with saving lives right right <laughs> yeah. hey i want to ask you real quick um is there something that we haven't talked about that you want to say well, the thing I th think I wanted to talk about was the recovery stuff because I've never, this is the first recovery yeah. oriented show. Yeah, so yeah. that was the one that I felt like yeah. I had to say because I, I don't get a chance to say it on another that show. That was awesome. That was oh, awesome. Really? Yeah. Fantastic. I do want to ask you this. I ask everybody this question. If, um, if you were to, if there, if you were to say something to somebody out there that is struggling, what would you tell that person? I would tell that person that your best ammunition against that which you're struggling with is to literally constantly do good things for others. Mm -hmm. And I've taken it right from that woman because yeah. that's what she said. She said, as soon as I stopped helping others all the time, as soon as I stopped, I became vulnerable again. To yeah. my addiction i love that i love that <laughs> it's just it was unbelievable and you know i remember it from me because look at what i do i do you know i i do this all day kind of and i absolutely love the you know it's like as soon as i'm all of a sudden my passion is my endorphins are raised yeah. when these people call and I know that I can make a difference. You know, I, I'm, and, and we're working together as how, how we can get this thing so that we can do our magic for them. Well, hey, I want to thank you for doing this. I really appreciate this. And um, um, hey, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of High Wall Clean. As I always like to end this and say, let's keep getting high, but let's do it clean. I'll see you soon. Thanks.